Welcome to today's, today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Grace Nicolette, Vice President of Programming and External Relations at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. And today, I'm excited to welcome you to our webinar on New Attitudes, Old Practices, the provision of multi-year general operating support. For those of you who are not familiar with the Center for Effective Philanthropy, we're a nonprofit with offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts in San Francisco. Our mission is to provide data and create insight so philanthropic funders can better define, assess, and improve their effectiveness, and as a result, their intended impact. We help foundations and major donors hear and act on feedback from their nonprofit partners, students in local school networks, and other key stakeholders. And we do this through our assessments, our evidence-based resources on effectiveness, and our programs. Our mission is driven by the belief that more effective philanthropic funders can have a profoundly positive impact on nonprofit organizations and the people and communities that they serve. As a nonprofit, we rely heavily on grant funding and individual donations. In addition to the earned revenue from our assessments, I hope you'll listen today and consider supporting CEP's work, whether by inquiring about a foundation assessment, underwriting a new piece of research that will benefit the field of philanthropy, like the one that we'll be discussing today, or just a financial gift. We'll be sharing a few links in the chat box on how to get in touch with us. Thank you in advance. Next, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items for our time today. First, we are in a webinar format, which means all of you are muted and will have your videos off upon entering the session. If you have questions for the panelists during today's presentation, and we hope you do, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We'll try to be as responsive to as many as we can during the Q&A time. You'll notice that you will not see other questions in the chat, but rest assured that there are likely other attendees also asking questions at the same time. We'll also be sharing some resources with you via the chat box, so feel free to check there for helpful links and resources. Well, we will not be using the hand raising function on this webinar as we are not asking attendees to speak their questions today. If you require technical assistance, please do reach out to my colleague, Say Darling. His email is saed at cep.org and he can assist you. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to all attendees in a follow-up email. Now, I'd like to introduce everyone to our panelists for today. We're thrilled to have with us today as our moderator, Hillary Pennington from the Ford Foundation. Hillary is Ford's Executive Vice President for Program and she's also a CEP board member. She oversees all of Ford's programs globally as well as the Foundation's BUILD program and the Office of Strategy and Learning. A national expert on post-secondary education and intergenerational change, Hillary joined the Ford Foundation in 2013. We'll also hear shortly from my colleague, Ellie Buteau, Vice President of Research. Ellie oversees the design, execution, and writing of CEP's research and manages our organization's research team. She's also a leading authority on foundation strategy, foundation performance assessment, and foundation grantee relationships as well as an expert on research design and statistical analysis. She's co-authored uh, or authored numerous reports, articles, opinion pieces, and blog posts on issues related to philanthropy, including being a co-author on the report we're discussing today. We're also excited to welcome today Fatima Angeles, Vice President of Programs for the California Wellness Foundation. She's responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the Grants Program Department, which includes oversight of Cal Wellness's grant making. She joined Cal Wellness as a program director in February 1998 and became the director of evaluation and organizational learning in 2006. She has also served as the vice chair of the board of the Grantmakers in Health and as secretary of the board of Northern California Grantmakers. And last but not least, we're also excited to invite today Maitri Morarji, director of programs at Foundation for a Just Society. For nearly 20 years, Maitri has leveraged resources in support of global women's rights movements through grant making fundraising, and philanthropic advocacy. Prior to joining FJS, she was a senior program officer at the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund. Thank you all in advance uh, to the panelists, especially for taking time to be with us today. Ellie, I'd like to invite you to join me on screen now. Thank you, Grace. I'd like to start by thanking um, the Ford Foundation, um, which funded the research that we're sharing today. Discussions about multi-year general operating support grants are not new. Nonprofit leaders have repeatedly 
called for long-term flexible grants, and many leaders in the sector have made the case for the benefits of and the importance of multi-year general operating support. Yet, over the past two decades, not much has changed in the provision of multi-year general operating support. So we came to this research with four questions. What are the benefits of multi-year general operating support grants? How much multi-year general operating support are foundations providing? What are the attitudes of foundation boards, CEOs, and program officers toward the provision of multi-year GOS? And what barriers are preventing foundations from providing more multi-year general operating support? To answer these research questions, we collected data from a variety of sources. We surveyed foundation CEOs and program officers. We surveyed nonprofit leaders, and we conducted in-depth interviews with foundation leaders. One piece of context I want to note is that we collected this data at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, just before the COVID-19 pandemic hit the US. Um, and we completed our interviews at the very beginning of March before the pandemic hit here. Ultimately, our data revealed three key findings. First, nonprofit leaders report that receiving multi-year general operating support would result in many benefits to the health of their organizations. It gives the ability to plan, the opportunity to focus on the work, and the capacity to invest in staff all of which ultimately increase the impact they can have. Second, foundation leaders' attitudes and practices are not well aligned when it comes to the provision of multi-year general operating support. Foundation CEOs believe that general operating support and multi-year grants are effective for supporting grantees' work, and the majority also report that they are in favor of increasing the percentage of grantees that receive this type of grant. Yet, many foundations provide no multi-year general operating support, and those that do only provide it to a small percentage of the nonprofits that they support. Finally, we were not able to identify any significant common barriers that foundation leaders experience when they are providing multi-year general operating support or trying to increase the provision of it. So, why isn't it being done more widely? Well, from our data, we find that it's simply not a fit for foundations approaches, hasn't been prioritized by foundations, or for a subset of community foundations, it's not seen as possible given their constraints. But we did interview a subset of foundation leaders whose foundations provide more multi-year general operating support than typical. And we find with those foundations that providing so much multi-year GOS is an intentional choice because they believe it will help build trust, strengthen relationships with grantees, and increase impact. So let's turn to the first key finding, which describes nonprofits' perspectives and experiences with multi-year general operating support. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the majority of non nonprofits were facing financial strain. 57% of the nonprofits we surveyed said they weren't able to, or were at significant risk of being unable to, cover their essential operating costs during the past three years. And yet, only 41% of nonprofit leaders report that their organization received any multi-year general operating support during the year prior to the pandemic. Even at nonprofits that did receive multi-year general operating support, they received very little of it. Most of them report that less than one quarter of their foundation funding was multi-year general operating support. The most frequent reason why nonprofit leaders believe that foundations provide the little multi-year general operating support is a lack of trust in nonprofits. So given this context, we turn to our second finding, to the foundation perspective on multi-year general operating support grants. We found, as I mentioned earlier, that foundation leaders' attitudes and practices are not well aligned. While foundation CEOs have largely positive attitudes toward multi-year GOS, few of their foundations provide it, 
And when they do, they provide it to only a small percentage of grantees. This chart shows change in foundation CEO attitudes over time. We collected data back in 2006 asking foundation CEOs their beliefs about the effectiveness of program project support and general operating support for the following elements that you see in this table and more which appear in the report. The first column in this table shows our results from 2006, the orange dots. The navy blue dots show our results from this current study. You could see that back in 2006, the majority of foundation CEOs believed that program and project support grants were more effective for assessing results, engaging foundation trustees, and more. Whereas for this study, we found a shift in attitudes that the majority of CEOs now believe that program project support grants are equally as effective as general operating support grants for these same aspects of their work. But while attitudes toward multi-year general operating support have become more positive, grant making practices have not changed much. Although 58% of the foundations in this study said that they provide some multi-year general operating support, they generally do this for few of their grantees. Most of the foundations that are providing this support are providing it to no more than one quarter of their grantees. Moving on to our last finding. Our third finding investigates the underlying reasons why there's this disconnect between foundation attitudes and practices. The disconnect doesn't appear to be due to any common barriers among foundations. When invited, few foundation CEOs mentioned obstacles to providing multi-year general operating support. And when foundations that currently provide it were probed about the drawbacks, their most frequent response was that there aren't any. Instead, CEOs at the majority of foundations that don't currently provide any multi-year general operating support simply say they haven't considered it because it's not a fit with the way that they work or it's not been a priority at their foundation. And as I mentioned, there's a subset of community foundations that said this isn't possible given constraints they face. As one foundation CEO told us, resources cannot be used simply for general support. Our resources are for conducting the work. Another said, while we recognize that multi-year GOS grants are more beneficial for grantees, we do not have a large enough pool of discretionary funds and like to support many different nonprofits in a given year. As I mentioned earlier, we interviewed leaders at 24 foundations that provide more multi-year general operating support than is typical. And in comparison to most foundations that don't provide much or any general operating support, this group of funders has made the intentional choice to provide so much multi-year general operating support because they believe that it yields crucial benefits. They believe providing multi-year general operating support builds trust between funders and grantees, strengthens funder-grantee relationships, leads to greater foundation and greater grantee impact, and is easier and more efficient for funders and grantees alike. In interviews, one foundation leader told us, unrestricted giving requires trust. Many grant makers don't trust their grantees. They want presumed control over a line item budget that they can hold people responsible for, which ultimately suppresses impact and results. Another said, our goals as a funder are wholly dependent on and inextricably linked to the organizations we support and their ability to achieve their outcomes. For us to achieve impact in the world, we hold ourselves to helping grantees achieve their outcomes. So the results of this research raise several additional research questions. Will the benefits experienced by the foundations that are providing more multi-year GOS lead others to provide or increase their provision of multi-year GOS? Uh, I'll share that on our website, as we released this report, we released two other pieces. One is a compilation of five profiles of foundations that do provide more multi-year GOS than typical. And 
leaders from two of those funders are on this panel today. And we also released a guide based on the advice and experiences of the 24 foundations we interviewed for foundations that are interested in increasing their provision of or starting to provide multi-year GOS. Another question this leaves us with is, will the COVID-19 pandemic, the ensuing economic crisis and increased attention to longstanding inequities have an impact on the provision of multi-year GOS? Or will foundations continue to operate as they have been in spite of calls for change? And really, here is the moment of opportunity for change, 2020, these compounding crises. While few foundations in this study planned to increase their multi-year general operating support, data that we collected over the summer, just a few months after the data we collected for this study, uh, indicate that a number of foundations are changing practice due to the pandemic, and they were able to suddenly shift gears and remove restrictions and make new unrestricted grants. They made a choice and they did it. We'll be publishing those results in the coming weeks. But the big question remains, uh, will they sustain this change or will they return to the reality we saw in this study that we're discussing today? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hillary and join the other panelists. Thank you, Ellie, for a fantastic presentation. And I also want to say I've been tracking some of the questions we're beginning to get in the Q&A, which are very sophisticated, excellent questions. And I just want to say to the audience, you know, I know you represent a range of perspectives, many of you very knowledgeable or um, at least hold very strong opinions on this subject. So please don't hold back. Um, please enter questions that you have in the Q&A and I will moderate so that we are able to get uh, to get to a lot of them. Um, so I'm really excited for the conversation that we are about to have. And I want to uh, get us started by, a, you know, I'm gonna ask sort of a, a cluster of questions and we're going to try to have as much of a conversation, um, Fatima and, and Maitri and Ellie and I as possible in this format. And, I, and the first question, I would like to start with you, Fatima, and then go to Maitri. And that, and that question really is, you are, you sit in foundations that, that have this as a common practice. And I would love to hear from you, what, um, what makes it easy to do grant making like this? What makes it hard? What lessons would you, um, have you learned that you could share with others? And Fatima, let's start with you. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be part of this conversation and congratulations to CEP for just a really terrific uh, report. Um, what makes it easy to give core support? You know, a couple of things we've been doing, we call it core operating support, general operating support. We also do multi-year support. So it's the uh, Voulez, my God multi-year general operating dollars. Um, what makes it easy is that our approach to grant making is predominantly through general operating support. It was a decision made by our board and our, by our CEO uh, many, many years ago. Part of what makes it easy is that during that time, we aligned our approach and our goals um, with core operating support dollars. We, we believe then, and we believe it now, but for us to achieve our mission as a foundation, we need the partnership of strong nonprofit organizations. And we know, and, and this study again underscores mm -hmm. this, that to be a strong organization, these organizations need flexible dollars, multi-year um, to make them grow, to make them stronger, to, to be able to focus on their mission. So in some ways it was, and it's not some ways, it's sort of a no brainer for us. We can only, get to our mission through partnerships with nonprofits. We need those nonprofits to be strong, sustainable, creative, innovative, adaptable. And core operating support dollars allow them to do that. The other reason that this has been easy for us is we've been at it for a while. And so we've been able to see the benefits of providing core operating support as a key strategy for our foundation. All of the, um, the points that um, Ellie made are true for us. We have developed strong trust-based relationships with our grantees, and that's good in a number of ways. One, we can call on them if we need to learn something and, and not have that awkward sort of funder-grantee conversation. We believe that they're telling us what it is, 
um, because we have been funding them for a long time and we trust them and we give them core support. Um, and we are learning all the time from the work that they do uh, because of the, the trusted relationship. Um, we are also able to, to meet our other goals, our other strategies, because we have these organizations uh, working uh, using core support dollars. I want to underscore one one kind of grant making that really benefits from multi-year core support funds, and those are our policy advocacy organizations. Mm -hmm. Policy change is a long end game, um, and organizations need to be able to stay the course uh, to manage all of the crazy political issues and policy sort of savviness, and core support allows them to focus and plan a longer game, a longer campaign, to train up residents to do organizing. Um, how do you support movements? Core support uh, for other organizations. What Pastor, makes that, it hard? That's, a, that's such ahead. a great um, point that you're just making and not to throw you off, but I wanted to sure. ask you, you know, so you see these benefits and, and particularly I agree with you for the long game, it's essential. And it's really different than um, in an incremental way, relieving grantees of, of restrictions or freeing things up because it allows them to plan ahead. But, you know, you talked in the prep call about the challenge of metrics and assessment, which I think does is a sticking point for some. So can you talk a little bit more in addition to the benefits about how you, how you measure this and how you um, assess risk for this kind of grant making? Yeah, that is, that is the sticky point uh, around core support because it's easier to track project outcomes uh, and widgets that's related to your own foundation's funding. With core support, mm -hmm. you are investing in the organization, not necessarily what they produce, right? I mean, it's, it's all of that. So we'll, what we have decided is one to give ourselves a break uh, and really change the metrics we were looking at from before, um, before we shifted to general operating support uh, approach. So we're looking at things like, is the organization stronger than when we first met them? Um, were they able to deliver on the key strategies of their work, which have to be in alignment with our priorities? Mm -hmm. um, are, they in the, are they in the right environments to do their work well? So these are the things that we're looking at Mm -hmm. challenging to ascribe all of their success and even their challenges to our funding uh, because yeah. we have we, we are very comfortable with contribution rather than attribution mm -hmm. but it is still challenging to measure um, but that's that's our own baggage you know we need to yes, figure well, out truth be told it's it's pretty hard to measure and attribute yeah. most of what foundations do but I think that is a that is a common challenge that people face. And I'm gonna just pause yep. you there for a minute because I wanna get Maitri into this conversation with really the same question, Maitri, as you all have done this kind of funding. Um, what makes it easy? What makes it hard? Any kinds of lessons you would like to share? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And um, thanks for this opportunity as well to share some of our experiences at Foundation for a Just Society. And rather than repeating much of what Fatima says, I'm going to try to actually complement and, and build on what she has said, because I think we share a lot of the same philosophy and, and what's worked well for us um, in this work. So what's easy for us? I mean, I would say, um, first of all, multi-year general operating support, the commitment to multi-year general operating support is built into our strategic plan. Um, so we have set a yardstick for ourselves of providing at least 70% of our funding each year as multi-year general operating support. So it's really built into the DNA of the organization, I would say. So that's the first thing that makes it easy. Um, I would also add that we have a staff and board that are incredibly supportive of this approach to funding. And in fact, I would say that our board asks more questions of us as staff when we aren't recommending grants that are multi-year general operating support ones. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, and can and then, you, what, kinds of questions yeah. do they, what kinds of questions do they ask you? That's such an interesting comment. Yeah, I mean, I would say primarily, so we have a real commitment to supporting particular populations. So we don't work under thematic lines. We work in different parts of the world. So we have regional strategies. And then we really seek to reach those kind of most marginalized or left behind within the populations of women, girls, and LGBTQI. So they are really asking who is, who is leading the organizations 
that seek to serve these populations? And are those folks represented in the leadership of the organizations? So for example, they would ask questions if we're funding in Francophone West Africa, why are you supporting an organization that's that's led by a European who's living in Francophone West Africa? Why isn't it, a, are you supporting a, a locally led organization that's really kind of constituent representative, representing the constituents they seek to serve? So they would ask questions like that, for instance, um, that's really about elevating the leadership of those we seek to serve um, through our funding. And then I, I would also just add in terms of what's been easy for us is that most of our grants are approved internally. So we have a threshold for funding and most of our grants are improved, approved by the internal leadership, uh, meaning they, they don't go to the board at all for approval. And both our program officers making those funding recommendations um, and those at the leadership level who are approving grants, we come from nonprofits. We come from public foundations. We've spent most of our working life in the nonprofit sector. So we have been in a fundraising role, and I think we really have a deep understanding of the profound impact of multi-year general operating support. So we're applying that lens when we're actually looking at funding recommendations being put forward and have a really deep understanding of what that means and what you can do with that type of funding. Um, in terms of what's been harder, I would say, I mean, we fund both in the US context as well as internationally. And as I'm sure many of you know, outside of the US, um, we actually, we are making grants that are both um, expenditure responsibility grants as well as equivalency determination grants. And procedurally, it's much more challenging to, to make grants uh, to expenditure yes. responsibility yeah. organizations doing general operating support. So it means doing a little bit of a dance and kind of accommodating to be able to be as flexible as we possibly can and supporting our grantees with as much administrative support as we can. So really making sure that they have a significant amount of the grant that's available for kind of overhead um, for staffing costs for rent or for things like that. And then the last thing I'll say about what's hard also, and maybe not hard, but really just more interesting is that um, we're in the early stages of building a monitoring evaluation and learning system. Um, and so we, we it, it's not baked yet. Um, so which, which is kind of tricky and interesting at the same time. Um, and so we plan to really develop an evaluation framework that reflects our commitment to providing multi-year general operating support. Um, and as such, we recognize that our outcomes and indicators may need to be different because we're funding not only to make progress against certain outcomes and advance certain rights of particular populations that we care about, but also to build strong and resilient organizations, which we're really deeply committed to. Uh, so it's such a, we, you know, we um, have that same challenge that the two of you mentioned at Ford, given our, our, our similar kinds of investments. And we um, similarly are doing an evaluation. And I, you know, hopefully for all of us, that investment will help others as they think about this kind of of support. So Ellie, I, we're going to turn in a minute to a different cluster of questions that has to do with how this kind of support um, can be helpful for, for foundations that are increasingly interested in funding on racial justice, racial equity. Um, but before we do, there's a bunch of questions um, coming in that, have, that, that really get at, is there anything this research would help us say about the types of foundations that are the most likely to provide this kind of support? Does their size matter and you know or their their focus and then similarly that anything we might know about the types of organizations that most benefit and obviously we're hearing from two foundations that are fairly focused on social justice kinds of issues and the long game right so i'm curious what you may have to comment on those initial questions i would say that um there aren't any particular characteristics from the research that were strong predictors of whether or not foundations were providing multi-year GOS or not, other than, um, you know, as my fellow colleagues have said on this call, really the, the attitudes and priorities uh, of the leadership of the organization. I would say that's what came through most clearly in the research rather than particular foundation characteristics, other than the subset of community foundations that I mentioned earlier who said mm -hmm. that there were different constraints they face. That's great. Well, I think, you know, just as we pivot subjects, I think it is very possible to um, begin to evaluate impact from this kind of funding. You know, what we know about most nonprofits is the ways in which foundations fund them sets them up to starve, 
right? We give one year small grants that are very project supported grants. So this notion of organizational strength and distance traveled, you know, have, have, have they traveled a distance towards strength from where they started as an organization? And can they have a bigger impact on the issues that they work on by virtue of predictability, ability to plan? Those are things that can be, um, can be assessed and can be assessed in ways that include the kind of impact that they've been able to have. And I think, you know, for each of the of you on the panel, as we talked, the time of COVID to the point you made, Ellie, is a time when all of that ability to be able to pivot and, re and re redirect um, turns out to be incredibly important. And I think it will be interesting to see, looking back on this period, whether organizations that get this kind of funding are better able to do that. But I wanted to turn our, um, our conversation right now to a different set of issues, which are also very um, pressing in this moment of time. And that is the moment of racial reckoning that our, that our country is in, needs to be in. And, you know, I think it's promising that many, many foundations have made statements and have made commitments over these recent months to do more uh, to address racial inequality and racial justice. But I would love to hear, uh, especially from you, Fatima and Maitri, how you think about the relationship between this kind of funding and issues of racial justice, um, what choices you make, what kind of impact it can have. And, and as you answer that also, whether your own foundations make a distinction between funding organizations that work with um, communities of color versus organizations that are led by um, people from communities of color, because I think we know that organizations led by people of color are systematically underfunded um, compared to their percentage and representation in the population. So how do you think about My God funding in relationship to racial justice? And Maitri, maybe let's start with you this time and then we'll come to Fatima. Sure, thank you for that question, Hillary. Um, so, I mean, as a starting point, I would say in my response to the first question, I did mention that we really focus on particular populations um, in our funding that we see have been kind of systematically left out, um, left out of civil society also and out of civil society leadership, um, both in the US context, as well as in all the regions that we work in outside of the country. So, for example, um, in Francophone West Africa, if we want to try to fund disability rights work, we support a disability rights led organization. Um, and similarly, we have a strong focus, we have a portfolio focused on the US Southeast, so US context as well, our funding in the US context, and where we are principally funding uh, organizations that are led by people, people of color. And that really comes from a, a long term institutional commitment, really from our founder and president of a vision of, um, of supporting work that's really led by those who will be who are the most impacted and who really can have um, a profound impact on on like shaping what the future should look like. So it really comes from like a deep commitment at an institutional level and how that plays out in our grant making is really that we're looking to support those types of organizations. So those are absolutely prioritized for us um, in this COVID context, um, we, and COVID context, as well as uh, a moment of kind of racial justice reckoning in the US, um, we have, because we've already been providing principally multi-year general operating support, we're actually looking at other mechanisms whereby we can be the most flexible and responsive in this moment. Um, and we're doing things like we've provided some additional funding for our US based work, um, uh, both focused around racial justice as well as focused on kind of this political moment um, in the US context, so acknowledging that as well. Um, and then we're, we're trying to find other ways to be as flexible as we can for our grantees, and that includes things like easing what it takes to apply for funding, for instance, enabling as much flexible funding as we as we can going off kind of off cycle off our typical grant making cycles, um, really reducing reporting requirements for grantees. So finding as many ways as possible to acknowledge kind of the pressure that many organizations are under um, and really just continuing to be there with as much flexible multi year general operating support as we can. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Fatima, what about you? What would you say on that question? 
similar to my team and similar to why we do core support, um, racial equity and racial justice is a, a value and a goal for the foundation from the beginning. Um, our, our board leadership, our, our CEOs have always wanted to make sure that Cal Wellness looks like California. And so our board and our staff reflect the diversity of the state. Um, and because racial equity and racial justice is a value, a priority, a goal for us, we are, we are looking to support um, organizations led by people of color. Um, we certainly support organizations that serve uh, communities of color. That's the majority of our grantees. But I, I'm proud to say that the majority of our grantees are also organizations led by people of color, both on the board mm. side and on the executive uh, management side. Um, uh, and I think for all of the reasons that we, we all appreciate. Uh, in the time of COVID that we're living in, even more so general operating support uh, is important. We've done a couple of things similar to what Maitri has done in her organization. We're putting out more dollars uh, at the mm -hmm. door to respond to the need. Uh, we have forgiven reporting uh, to our existing grantees um, just uh, to, to help ease uh, their, their burden. Quick turnaround uh, for us. Mm -hmm. um, with, so we, we're changing our, our systems and our operations to, 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 to meet the demand. Um, and I, this is something unrelated to COVID, but even more important because of COVID. Right now, our multi-year, we, we like to give three-year cooperating support grants. We want to do more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as much as we can afford it, we are um, uh, testing longer grant durations, larger mm -hmm. grant size. The other thing that we do that we've always done, which we believe is a benefit um, to organization, is that we give the grant all, all in one lump sum. Yes. When they, uh, and we do that for a number of reasons. One, we trust the organizations already, so we trust them to manage the dollars for the length of the, the grant mm -hmm. duration. Plus, they can bank it and earn interest uh, yes. from, that, from, that, from those dollars. Um, so I think these are elements of trust-based philanthropy that I just sort of want to lift up. Well, I think that's trust-based philanthropy. It has there's a huge overlap between um, my God support and and trust and the principles of trust-based philanthropy. So I am actually going to switch us five minutes early to questions because I've been looking at a little of the questions we're getting in, and they're really good questions. Um, I'm going to just pull out a couple to put to you and, and Ellie to include you as well. So here's one, you know, we all know the benefits to a nonprofit of getting this kind of support, but this conversation is too one-sided. What are the potential disadvantages? Uh, Multi-year commitments reduce the incentives of nonprofits to perform effectively, to earn follow-on support, could reduce the ability of grantors to redeploy assets in more productive ways if they've overestimated the effectiveness of the grantee. So if we're trying to have maximum of impact in a world of imperfect assessment. How do you think about the trade-offs um, and the potential disadvantages of this kind of support? And I would, that's really open to either of you, whoever wants to jump in first and Ellie, I'll close with insights you might like to add as well. I can jump in um, and take a shot at that um, and talk about one disadvantage that we've experienced. So. And I'll just give an example because I think that's probably clearest. Um, so we fund in Francophone West Africa, um, which is a part of the world that doesn't have a lot of philanthropic dollars going to it. Um, it's a really kind of chronically underfunded part of the world. Um, and, and what we found as we've built out our portfolio over the last couple of years and added more and more, and our focus really has been on supporting local organizations as much as possible, local and regional organizations that are led by people from, from the region and by the constituents they seek to serve. Um, and what we find in some, at some times is that it's hard to find organizations and it can be hard to find organizations um, in some of the countries that we're working in um, that are working on the, with the populations and on the issues that are kind of principal, of a principal importance to us as an organization and are really prioritized for FJS. And so what we've done is we've engaged sometimes with, with organizations that are 
seem philosophically aligned <laughs> with where we want to go and the, the populations and issues that we care about, but sometimes aren't working exactly in that country or, are, or have an interest in working, for example, on disability rights issues, but have never done work in that area before or have a very small program. And we're certainly interested in seeing them kind of scale up their commitment to working with particular populations or in a particular geographic context. And so in those cases, I, we, we found it difficult sometimes to give um, general operating support specifically. We can give restricted multi-year funding, but to give the general operating support has been difficult in those contexts because we have some hesitation, I would say, around are they actually going to invest in building out their work in this geography or with this population when they have little experience of doing that? And how can we kind of incentivize them to, to, to do more of that work? And so I would say that's where the hardest conversations around mm -hmm. um, general operating support specifically happen. And what we found, how to deal with that, it's, it's not an uh, so entire solution. But one way of doing that is that we have to have really deliberate and kind of very honest conversations with the organization continuously over yes. time as we're building the relationship with them to make it really clear that these are issues and these are the populations we care about. So even if we're giving you general operating support, we want you to know that this is what's really prioritized for us and really make it clear that they have an understanding of that as we go into the relationship. So that's something that is not, it's not a given and, and it's not, not always easy. Yeah, yeah. We have found also it changes the nature of conversation with the grantees. What about you, Fatima? Are, are, are any potential downsides or disadvantages that you have seen or experienced? Yeah, you know, I appreciate the comment that this is a one-sided conversation because clearly these are the people who have drank the Kool-Aid, so, um, so touche. Um, so it's hard for me to figure out the downside because we are so in it and, mm -hmm. and are such champions for this um, approach to, to grant making. A downside is that we can't, our resources are, are limited. Yes. Uh, so there's there are always more requests than we can, mm -hmm. we can um, respond to. You know, a potential downside is because our grant makers are 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 fans of our, our grantees. We're also a responsive foundation, so we have an open application. And so we want to support new organizations. And sometimes what can happen is instead of a three-year grant to make their allocations last, grant mm -hmm. makers are doing two years, two years, mm -hmm. two years. But it's it's running counter to our of our value of longer term support. Yes. Um, so that's sort of an internal challenge that we're having to, to manage, but decision making is challenging. Um, you know, I, I want to, I, I disagree with one of the questions around providing core support is a distance, multi-year is a distance, yes. uh, dis, uh, incentive to nonprofits to perform. Um, we have found the reverse. Um, that because it's multi-year uh, and because they have core support to get the dollars up front, they're actually managing those dollars much better than we would have, uh, I think, on our own to just sort of dole it up based on metrics. They're careful about that because they, it has to last uh, the, the length of the, the life of the grants. And, and what we're finding, too, because of the conversations we're having with our grantees, the incentives are not the dollars that we give. The incentives are the relationships they have with their community members and the issues they're working on. Mm -hmm. And so they are performing better because they have dollars in the bank um, to, to address the issues that they see coming. So they're able to adapt um, quickly and they can plan for the long term. So um, that's my answer to, to the yeah, question. Those are, those are great answers. Thank you. And I would just add briefly from Ford's experience before turning a question to Ellie that, um, you know, one potential disadvantage downside is um, undue dependence on the relationship with the with your foundation, with foundations that that take this kind of approach, and the risk that other, that other funders say, well, oh, that that such and such organization is fine. They've got multi year support, general support. We can give them less. So that is a potential downside. And then I think in our experience, there's always a tension for program officers, particularly on the multi year dimension of this, Fatima, as you just mentioned. You know, can, am I going to have a bigger impact by funding perhaps fewer organizations better over a longer period than funding a larger number of organizations at a lower level over shorter periods. And I think, you know, in our experience at Ford, what we have seen is 
we started out with a commitment to about 30% of our grant making being what we call build like, meaning my God kind of funding. And now it has become our default by choice of program officers. And now 70% of our grants are like this. And I think it is because our program officers are finding that this is just a much more effective way to advance impact. Um, there was another question and then Ellie, I'm gonna throw one to you about, is there an amount that is um, relevant? And you know, again, in, um, in our experience, and I don't know Fatima or my, my tree, whether you would, well, I, let me start actually, there, there, for us, we do the two things together, multi-year and general operating together. So we give five-year um, general operating grants. And we have found that um, the right amount is probably around 30% of an organization's budget. More than that is you know, too much of a risk of dependence on one funder. Less than that um, makes it hard for them to do really transformational um, kinds of work. And I may come back and ask you, Fatima and Maitri, whether you have a, a sort of sense of the right size of that kind of grant. But Elliot, I wanted to ask you first, um, we put these two things together and we debated a lot of, about this in the design of the study, the multi-year piece and the general operating piece of this issue. Uh, and so there was a question, could you just comment on those two different things? And does the value of both of them bundled together seem to be greater than um, the parts individually? Would love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, so a few thoughts on that. I'll say from, from the research we conducted back in 2006, absolutely from the nonprofit perspective, bundling the two together um, you know, led to more impact uh, in their own experiences. Um, so that, that would be a yes from the nonprofit perspective. Um, related to that, Hillary, and to the, the initial question that, that led to this conversation, I will say that you know, we asked many times in many ways in this research for challenges or barriers to providing this type of support or to providing more of it. And only a handful, like a small handful of leaders said that they're concerned that multi year GOS will tie up funds for the future uh, or that it, it doesn't give them the opportunity to be more responsive. We, so we did hear those things. It was extremely infrequent uh, that those were raised in the data. Um, and to your point about program officers, I'll just say that at least in, in this research, we found that program officers rate themselves as more positive um, on providing multi-year general operating support than CEOs think program officers uh, tend to be about this issue. So, um, so yeah, so on the program officer side, we went into this with a hypothesis um, that we had heard in the field that perhaps it's program officers that are, are a barrier or getting in the way. And the data in this study certainly did, did not support that hypothesis. That's so interesting. Well, Fatima, Maitri, anything you would like to add on that, that trade-off or, or about the role of program officers? You know, I, I well, well, we have staff and we're hiring people now, but I remember when I was a program officer, when we switched from project-based funding or initiative style funding to doing general operating support work, I was not a proponent of it because mm -hmm. I thought that I would be rendered useless. You know, why else did you hire me if it wasn't gonna come from my ideas or work with the foundation leadership uh, to implement our own vision? Um, and I, you know, I was in the, a champ, a champion for it. And then quickly realized that the kinds of conversations we were having with nonprofits, uh, with our grantees, the quality of the conversation, what I learned from the conversations uh, made us better grant makers. Um, and so it, it, so one, so that was my own sort of transformation mm -hmm. as, as a practitioner in this field. Um, and two, the folks we hire at the foundation, um, we usually are usually coming from nonprofit organizations, uh, either for our program directors, they've led them or they're a, a, yes. a key leader in the organization. They understand core support. Um, and so they are, you know, they, they come wanting to, to, to use that approach, but that's who we hire because that's the kind of foundation we are. Mm -hmm. So we probably have a bias towards our uh, staff who understand the value of core support. I think that's not an insignificant hypothesis that one reason for where you see foundations that do more of this kind of funding is that either their program officers or their leadership or their boards have experience running 
a nonprofit organization and know what it's like to walk in the shoes of the leaders of them. Um, Maitri, anything you would want to add on either of these topics? Yeah, I mean, just to say, I absolutely agree with you, Fatima. I think the, the hiring makes a huge difference. And I mentioned that earlier in my response also, that I think both at our program officer level and our leadership level, we're all coming from nonprofits or public foundations. So have a real deep respect for that. Just getting back to the question of, of clustering the multi-year, the my and the God, whether those are clustered together or not, um, just to add that for us, you know, oftentimes, almost all of our grants are multi-year grants. I would say there are times when we're, uh, we're working with an organization for the first time and funding them for the first time where we'll do a one-year grant the first time around, but then we'll very quickly switch to multi-year funding after that first year of supporting them. So it's across the board, almost all multi-year funding. On the general operating support, I think it, it depends a lot on like, you know, whether we're trying to achieve a particular outcome or push an organization in a certain direction. But as I mentioned earlier, um, we still have this kind of benchmark of which is written into our strategic plan of at least 70% of our funding every year going um, in the form of general operating support. So that is a an absolute, like we will not drop below that amount. So it's still a, obviously a significant amount of our overall resources. That's huge. Well, let me ask you both a, a different question that has come up, which is given how you feel um, and your practices about my God support, multi-year and general operating, when when do you ever give project grants? And uh, what's the rationale and decision-making process when you decide to give project support versus uh, general operating support? You know, I'll, I'll start, I, you know, it, it, it comes from the request of the organization. Let's say we actually need this, it's time limited, we want to test, uh, a, we want a proof of concept for a model, for a campaign, so mm -hmm. we need project support. So we'll say, sure, that that's what you need, it fits with our strategies. Another, um, another kind of support that ends up being project, if it's a, a, a pooled fund, a collaborative sort of with other funders yes. to achieve a particular outcome. So for example, in California, the health funders in California got together to do a pooled fund to support COVID-19 outreach, communications campaign um, and contact tracing. It's for a limited time. Mm. Or, um, it's for a specific set of, set of issues. Um, so that's another reason yeah. to do project support funding. Those are great examples. How about you, Maitri? Yeah, I mean, just to add, to add to that as well, um, as I said, you know, most of our funding is in the form of multi-year general operating support. We found a couple of years ago, we did a, a like a strategy assessment to, to look at like what had happened over the last few years in terms of grant making and, and then to figure out kind of where do we want to go over the next five years. And one of our findings as we did surveys with our grantees was that even though we provide multi-year general operating support, most of our grantees don't use that funding for organizational development needs. And, mm -hmm. and that might speak to kind of like a sense of resource starvation in the field of women, girls and LGBTQI funding in much of the world. And so most of the organizations are applying that to, to, to projects and, and programs because that's what they typically have to do. And, um, and so they aren't always investing in kind of the organizational strengthening piece. And so we found that even though we were providing <laughs> flexible support, that wasn't where they were actually using their resources. And so we, we do restricted funding for things like communication strengthening, for things like addressing holistic safety and collective care. And these are issues that have both been identified across our grantees, depending, like it, it doesn't matter where in the world they are, but they've really like risen to the to the fore in terms of priorities that are cross-cutting um, and there are issues that we really care about as an organization and are written into our own strategy. So we've set aside funding that's kind of specifically restricted for work in that area, but among other foundations, those would, those would be considered kind of organizational development needs. Like why aren't they using general operating support for that? But they weren't, it turns out. So you we, know, we I, set aside. I totally resonate with that. We've had to do the exact same thing. I mean, this, this gets to the point of, of you know, most organizations, if they get general support, they use it for getting, for doing more, right? For adding to their activities because they're, they're so driven by mission. So we've had to do the same thing. It's general support for their activities, but we segregate a portion of it that requires them to tell us the restricted part, how they will do a variety of organizational strengthening things that we can be in direct 
conversation about um, over time. So that's interesting. Um, so Ellie, uh, this is a little bit maybe of an unfair question for you. So you can take a pass on it. Um, but there's there's been a question really about just the mechanics of this, the nuts and bolts. If you were a foundation that wanted to do more about this, and I'll, I'll ask you to also, um, Fatima and Maitri, but what kinds of onboarding or training or other kinds of systems could grant making institutions implement that could make this practice a more common practice? Did you get any sense of that from your, your qualitative interviews, Ellie? Yes, um, and there is a guide that's free to download on CEP's website accompanying this report that's based on those experiences to provide that type of guidance for foundations that are interested. Um, but I will say that some of what, what we learned uh, from those foundations was simply reviewing what your values are, focusing on how you can strengthen funder-grantee relationships, uh, considering how you center equity in the work that you do, um, thinking about trust and the importance of trust and how can your foundation um, change the way it thinks so that it can move more towards trust-based relationships with grantees. Um, but the guide on our website does have a lot more for those who are interested. That's great, thank you. Oh, this is very frustrating because we're so close to the end of time and, I, and there are many questions continuing to come into the Q&A. So we will keep them and track them. There's one um, of a question, how many renewal cycles of general operating support would you consider? And I think, you know, this is not the kind of, it's not like a vaccine, right? You can give a one and done organizational strengthening grant and that organization is going to be strong forever. I think, it, you know, I think what you're hearing from across the comments is that this is about a relationship. It's about the nature of a relationship that is based on continuous improvement and trust and uh, the commitment to, to getting better over time and having impact. And so I think that's one of the greatest downsides of this is to think that you can do it once, um, which, which gets to the larger issues of, of um, the values that underpin the decision to do this. We have two minutes and I'm gonna give Fatima and Maitri each a chance to say a really quick uh, piece of advice or closing remark before we close out with great thanks to everyone. Any last words? Yeah, let me just thank you all again for having Cal Wallace be part of this fantastic panel. I learned a lot from the conversation. And really my, my last words are, it's not as hard as you think uh, to, to move into uh, providing core support and multi-year support. There are enough foundations to help hold your hand, uh, to come to your board meetings and talk to your board. We're happy to do that. Um, and really, it's it's really because it's what our nonprofits need um, to be strong. Thank you. That is a beautiful closeout. Maitri? Yes, I will also say thank you so much for having FGS be part of this conversation. And not to sound glib, but just do it, I would say. And like start small and build up. And I think also, like, I think it's worth it for all of us, like, continuously to be examining what are the barriers within our foundations? Like, what is it really that prevents us from, from, from doing this? Um, and really digging deep on our understanding of risk, because I think risk has for so long in philanthropy been associated with small organizations. And, and we say we can't give multi-year general operating support to small organizations that don't have the budget, that don't have the track record. And I think we should just continuously re-examine what that notion of risk means um, and then dive in. Amen to both of you. And I just want to echo the thanks to this amazing panel, these amazing questions to Ellie and CEP for this really significant research. And yes, to say there is enough, there are enough people doing this, there are enough foundations doing this who are a source of best practices and as Fatima says would be willing to stand by your side if you just do it, as Maitri said, and to talk to your leadership teams and boards and program officers. So again, thank you so much for a really, really powerful session. And we are closed. Thank you. Bye everyone.